Hi everyone, I'm Megan Ramos with you here today on the Fastly Method YouTube channel. And actually today I'm gonna to introduce myself a little bit. So who am I and how did I get into fasting? Well, my personal life and my professional life sort of crashed head on in my mid twenties. Growing up, I was always really interested in preventative medicine. My mom has all kinds of really bizarre health conditions and doctors never tried to figure out why she had these health conditions. They just kept slapping on prescription after prescription to try to help manage her symptoms of these conditions. And that really bothered me. Like why aren't they trying to figure out what is wrong with her and fix that problem. But instead, they would treat her symptoms with medications. And of course, those medications would have numerous side effects that would cause other you know, symptoms and require, require other medications. And it was at one point where he, even here in Canada, her cost of medications per month cost almost $10,000 which is just really, really outrageous. So from a young age, you know, I really wanted to look for the root cause of disease and I wanted to get involved in academic research. When I was 15 years old, I had this amazing opportunity to volunteer to do some data entry at one of the largest medical facilities in North America in a nephrology department. Now, nephrology is a fancy term to describe kidney disease. So I was really interested in kidney disease. We have some family history of, of kidney issues. And from what I understood, especially from the media and from my education, was that kidney disease was it's just booming. Out of nowhere, it seemed that all of these patients were starting to develop chronic kidney disease or kidney failure. So I had this opportunity to do some data entry and to start learning about kidney disease, how it manifested, dialysis. There was a strong desire to prevent kidney disease. There was a lot of talking to the patients about their nutrition and their lifestyle to try to slow down the progression of kidney disease. Because unlike so many other medical conditions where you can just give prescriptions to, there's not too much that you can do for the kidneys. You really have to intervene with lifestyle interventions to try to slow down the progression or prevent the kidney disease from occurring in the first place. So this to me was my ideal field to be in. So I started doing research, data entry, and then I got to start to work with the patients who were on dialysis, uh, analyzing their medications, doing foot exams, and then I moved into other various areas of research in the nephrology department. And I stayed there for many, many years. There was a young nephrologist at the time named Dr. J. Jason Fung, who also had a very keen interest in disease prevention with his patients. And he would spend a lot of time educating his patients, trying to teach them about the importance of diet and lifestyle. He's such a good doctor and was always such a great inspiration to me while growing up. Well, all of this is going on and uh, in my teenage years being really interested in preventative medicine, but I was actually quite sick. At the age of 12 years old, I was told I had fatty liver disease. And at the age of 14, I was told I had polycystic ovarian syndrome or PCOS, as you might more commonly hear it referred to as. And no one could figure out why. None of my doctors, none of these specialists at these fancy pediatric hospitals understood why because my body mass index, my BMI, was actually classified as underweight. But in hindsight now, when I go back and I look at photos of myself, you know, I look tired. I didn't have defined muscles. I didn't look strong. And I know looking back that I might not have weighed very much, but my body composition was very poor in the sense that I had more fat mass than muscle mass and bone mass. So even though the number on the scale wasn't very high, I was mostly composed of body fat. I was not a very strong kid. I was always very tired, weak, and lethargic. So I was obese, but because doctors really only compare your weight to height ratio to come up with this range of obesity that you may or may not fall in, it didn't pick up on it, which is just so crazy because if someone has a lot of muscle mass, they might actually register as obese when you look at their BMI, but when you check for their body composition, they might only have 7% body fat. So they're definitely not obese. So modern medicine, traditional medicine has things really sort of 
messed up and I fell into that trap when I was a kid. So there I was, 12, 14 years old, clearly having metabolic syndrome, but I didn't fit the defined characteristics. So look at me, I wasn't overweight, I had a little bit of acne, nothing crazy. So their attitude was, she'll grow out of it. You know, it doesn't make sense that she has it, so she'll have to grow out of it at some point. You know, she's not going to be this medical anomaly. So as uh, my life progressed in my mid-20s, now I was getting really frustrated because I was working on a really big research project um, trying to find biomarkers, so markers in the bloodstream that could help detect kidney disease earlier on. But I realized most of the kidney disease that I was seeing come into the clinic was due to poor lifestyle habits, was due to high blood pressure, was due to type 2 diabetes, and none of the lifestyle interventions seem to be working. None of the diet, none of the exercise was helping any of these patients. And the diet, you know, we're recommending is the Canadian Food Guide. So I was getting really heartbroken thinking, gosh, there's nothing we can do from a lifestyle standpoint to help these people. Because if the diabetes gets worse or if the patients become more overweight and their blood pressure continues to go up, then there's nothing we can do. Their kidney disease is going to get worse. And I knew these patients were trying. I didn't believe for one second that they were lying. I knew they were following the diet plan. I knew they were listening to the registered dietitians. I knew that they were trying to go for as many walks and stay as active as possible. These people didn't want to end up on dialysis. They could see the dialysis patients every time they came to the clinic. They'd have to walk by the dialysis unit or one of the dialysis units. What a terrible life. Nobody wants that. So these patients were working really, really hard. And often when they would come in for their research appointments, they would just break down in tears. They'd be so upset because they were trying to do everything that they could from a lifestyle standpoint, but their conditions were still getting worse. They were gaining more weight, their blood sugars were going up, and their diabetes was still out of control, wrecking havoc on their kidneys. I wanted to help people get better and all I'm doing is watch people that I grow to care about die and there's nothing I can do to stop it. And Maybe medicine isn't the area that I actually want to spend my career. So I took some time off school just to think about what it is that I want to do with my life. And I thought to myself, you know, Megan, you've really got to get it together. You have fatty liver and you have PCOS. You have all this family history too of type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure and cardiac disease. My grandmother had 11 strokes by the time she passed away and two major heart attacks. My uncle died of at 36 from his second or third major heart attack rather. So it was just scary family history and I thought, okay, you know, maybe if you try now, maybe if you try all these lifestyle interventions now before you start to develop any more disease, maybe there's hope for you because you're so young. So I started seeing a fancy dietitian downtown Toronto, very expensive lady. I started working out with a personal trainer who lived next door and would literally shout at my bedroom window, it was time to get up to go for my training session. Um, I bought all kinds of foods and all different types of meal plans and followed the you know the Canadian food guide as closely as possible um, and the end result was I became quite obese and I developed type 2 diabetes. So there I was in, now in my 27 years old um, feeling incapacitated. I could barely get through the work day. Uh, I had laundry that was stacking up that was taller than I am in the corner of my room. I would come home from work and just sometimes fall asleep in my clothes without washing my face. I got to the point where I stopped wearing makeup or even trying to do my hair because I just didn't have the energy in the morning. I never woke up feeling rested. I was just a metabolic disaster. And I didn't think there was hope. And I gave up on even trying to sort out any sort of career for myself and I just stuck with it in the nephrology research team because I just didn't know what to do. I didn't have the mental capacity, I didn't have the energy, I didn't have the health. And at that point too, I truly thought my days were numbered. Like if I was developing type 2 diabetes in my 20s, what were my 30s going to look like? You know, my grandmother developed type 2 diabetes in her 70s and my father in his 50s. 
what was my future gonna look like? Kidney failure at 35, just dementia, Alzheimer's by the time I'm 40. Like, what kind of life was I gonna have? It was really heartbreaking to think about. So I just tried not to think about it. And I was literally just trying to get through the day every day. Jason Fung at the time was giving some lectures to patients who are willing to learn more in the office. And I was sitting in the research department one day and a colleague of mine came up and said, you know, Dr. Fung has lost his mind. He thinks he can cure type two diabetes through fasting, through starvation. And she started to laugh and she walked away and then the rest of my research colleagues got a giggle. And I thought, you know, like there's got to be something, you know, because where is this huge epidemic of type 2 diabetes a hundred years ago? Like it didn't exist. You know, what about our diets or lifestyle changed? Why did my grandmother get so many more years beyond me living disease free? What was going on? Like something was missing. And I always really enjoy Dr. Fung's talks. So I decided one day that I was just going to hang around the clinic when he was giving these talks and, and listen to what he had to say to his patients. I'm sitting there um, in the in the clinic and I'm listening to him talk about fasting and you know, fasting I never really associated with starvation, probably because we're from Toronto, which is the most culturally diversity in the world. And our clinic was located in a very diverse area within the city of Toronto. So I saw all kinds of patients fasting for almost every different religion over the course of the year. So fasting I never really associated with starvation. I associated it more with sort of a religious cleanse, a spiritual experience, but I never really thought of how it might impact the body. I, but I knew it wasn't harmful from watching all of these patients for so many years participate in religious fasts. So I'm listening to Dr. Fung talk about fat, like fasting and how it works in the body and how it can help actually break the cycle of insulin resistance. And it just made so much sense. So I went home and I digested the information and I started doing a lot of reading on fasting. I thought, okay, I'm young, I'm motivated. Like I've got all this motivation in the world. I'm going to do a seven day fast. Well, my first fast lasted 18 hours. I became really dehydrated. I went to the bathroom a whole lot so I definitely lost a lot of water weight my first day fasting and it was it was a bit of a disaster I didn't feel too well I was definitely magnesium depleted I was coming off of the standard North American diet I had already been trying to reduce my carbo intrate, or carbohydrate intake but I wasn't necessarily the best in the kitchen I ate out most of the time so it was a little bit more challenging. For me, it was just easy to try to fast and not eat than try to reinvent my diet. So I decided at first, okay, you know, maybe seven days is a little bit too much. So I'll do three 24 hour fasts a week. My work days are busy. It was really easy to skip lunch. I had too much stuff to do as it was. And I made sure to take some water, take some salt, take some chicken bone broth, and use those to help me get through the day. And I would fast on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, my busiest days of the week as it is. So for 24 hours, the first couple of weeks felt challenging, but towards the end of the second week, I thought, okay, this isn't so bad. You know, it's like when you go to the gym for the first time and you try to do presses, you might not be able to press very much weight, but if you keep practicing at that weight, over time it becomes easy, and then you have to increase your weight in order to challenge your muscles to break them down so you can grow them. So. That's a lot what fasting is like. Fasting is like a muscle. So the first 24 hour fast definitely felt like it was putting a lot of stress on my fasting muscle, but the six 24 hour fast didn't seem that tough. So from there, I increased it to 36 hours, but a 36 hour fast is where when you fast from dinner on Monday, for example, until breakfast on Wednesday, and you would fast all day Tuesday. Now, I didn't like eating breakfast. I was never hungry in the mornings. I was only ever hungry in the morning if I was bored. 
but definitely not during the weekday when I'm waking up, trying to rush, trying to beat the hectic morning commute, get all my work stuff together, get presentable, get into the office, try to get some stuff done before the office fills up with people. Like there was no boredom, so there was no desire to eat. So I try to fast all day Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I would eat Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. But I just couldn't bring myself to eat breakfast, at least on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I was just too busy. So I started fasting until lunchtime on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I would just eat lunch and dinner on those days, which now people are calling a 16-8 or an 18-6 fast. So on my non-fasting days, I did that. And on weekends, I would eat more of a late breakfast or an early lunch, and I would eat dinner. Saturdays, I would usually have gone out with friends or with a significant other, family, and then Sundays were usually an early family dinner at my mom's around four o'clock. So it gives me a little bit of extra fasting time until I get home from work at the end of the day the following Monday. So this worked really well for me and I carried on with this regimen um, pretty much for the course of six months. I told myself, you know, Megan, you need to think of fasting as a therapeutic treatment for your condition. You can't just do it if you feel like it's a good day to do it. You just need to buckle down and get your fasting done. So I committed myself to three fasts a week, ranging from 24 to uh, 42 hours just to give myself a little bit of flexibility. So we were usually Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Mondays and Wednesdays, I almost always did 42 hours worth of fasting. I would only cut it at 24 if there was a special celebration like my mother's 60th birthday dinner. And Fridays, I would uh, fast through the evening if I didn't have social plans. Otherwise, um, if I did have social plans in the evening, I would just do a 24 hour fast from dinner on Thursday until dinner on Friday. And over the course of the six months to I switched from a standard North American diet to actually a, a very strict ketogenic diet. And now that I'm healed at my insulin resistance, I can actually eat quite a lot more carbs and stay in fat burning mode. Um, but I had really overhauled my diet. I learned to cook. I started to embrace healthy, natural dietary fats that I grew up fearing because of my family history of cardiovascular disease. So I buckled down. I said, for six months, Megan, come hell or high water, you're going to do these three fasting days of the week. And as you but, or as your body you know, adapts and as time permits, you're gonna start working on changing your diet. And I did that. I wanted to get rid of this disease. I didn't want to drag this type two diabetes out for two or three years and, and let it wreak havoc on my body. I wanted to do it. I wanted to get it over with and I wanted to go back to a lifestyle of flexibility. So if I did wanna, you know, arrange a dinner for a Monday night, I could. Like I wanted to have this flexibility where I didn't feel pressured to do all kinds of fasting. So in six months, I had brought my hemoglobin A1C, your measure of you know, diabetes or the severity of your diabetes. I brought it down from 6.4 to 4.6%. I had completely reversed my fatty liver disease and I had reversed my symptoms of polycystic ovarian syndrome and I lost 60 pounds. Now I stand at about five feet tall so 60 pounds was a lot of weight, and I thought I had reached a goal weight. At the end of six months though, I had a body composition scan done called a DEXA body composition scan. It's similar to a bone mass density scan, and it will tell you what your bone mass density is uh, to a certain extent, not in very great detail, but it will also give you a good amount of detail about how much body fat you have, where it's located, how much muscle mass you have, where it's located. And I realized that even then, at this tiny goal weight that I had reached, I still had a lot of body fat and I was still considered to be obese. So I took, uh, took six weeks off. I went to Europe with some friends. I had a great time. Um, I actually lost weight on that trip, probably from no snacking and lots of walking. And when I got home, then for another few months, I got back into more of a strict regimented fasting routine. That was going back to um, back to 2011. Um, I had hit all my goals before we 
decided that we were going to launch our initial in-clinic program that we used to call the Intensive Dietary Management Clinic. And uh, we started that on June 5th, 2012. Um, I was uh, sitting happy and healthy and feeling really great come that date. We're now in February of 2020. Um, I've still maintained my weight. My liver's great. It's no fatty liver. My There's no diabetes. My a one is fantastic. My fasting insulin levels are good. I have regular menstrual cycles that I'm really happy about. I find it really easy to maintain my weight now. So that means that I am human and every now and then I do eat some junky stuff, um, most likely pizza. Um, but instead of having a pizza every Monday, I wait till I find like the most delicious pizza and uh, then I will indulge there. Um, so that ends up being about two or three pizzas a year. And I will have these moments, but I don't gain weight from them. They don't make my blood sugar levels go sky high. If I check my blood sugar levels two hours after I eat something, like pizza, they actually follow the normal curve. So they will go up immediately after you eat everybody well, but within two hours, they're back down into the normal range. And that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, what to see for type 2 diabetes reversal. So it's been a really awesome journey. Uh, I get to help so many people now be able to achieve the same results as I could. And really, if I can do it, anybody else can do it. You know, I grew up with a very sick mom, a very busy dad. Um, there was lots of fast food, pizza, Chinese food, fast food, just out, you know, all of the time. So lots of bread, lots of potatoes, lots of corn. I didn't even eat broccoli until I was 25 for the first time. I didn't eat Brussels sprouts until I was 30 and I met my now husband who had made me Brussels sprouts and I was too embarrassed to tell him that at 30 years old I had never eaten a Brussels sprout. So if I can do this, if I can, you know, reset and relearn all these aspects of the kitchen and start to embrace all of these different foods. And if I, I was a cereal snacker, I, <laughs> I would graze. They used to call me like the cookie monster in the clinic. Um, I love snacking and I thought that that was so good for me because that meant I was keeping my blood sugar levels stable all day. Uh, I, if I've been able to cut that out and go to regular meals and learn how to make efficient meals in the kitchen, um, if I can do that, I can fast, anybody can. Uh, so in this YouTube channel, um, we're gonna talk about tips for getting started with your fasting, tips for getting started modifying your diet. We'll go through the basic fasting protocols, what you can and can't have during a fast. We'll have some interviews with some interesting case stories or other experts in the field. And we'll try to provide you with the tools that you need to achieve the great success that I have throughout my journey. So thank you for joining me, everybody. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure to click like and click subscribe below. And we'll see you next time. Happy fasting.